Good morning, everyone. My name is Marcella Ferris, and as the director of the Lewiston Public Library, I would like to welcome everyone to the Great Falls Forum. The forum is a monthly speaker series featuring leaders in the areas of business, public policy, academia, and the arts. And it's the partnership of Bates College, The Sun Journal, and the Lewiston Public Library. This year is the 24th season of the program. So we thank you for your continued support and we welcome those of you who are attending the forum for the first time. A recording of today's program will be available starting tomorrow on the library's YouTube page. Please visit lplonline.org for more information. And please mark your calendar for the next Great Falls Forum that will take place on Thursday, November 18th at noon featuring Maine Representative Charlotte Warren with the talk entitled Criminal Justice Reform in Maine. More information on that will be available on lplonline.org. So a little housekeeping for today's program. Those of you on Zoom will see a Q&A option at the bottom of your screen. Uh, use this to enter any questions for our speaker today. And for those joining us on Facebook, uh, go ahead and type your questions into the comment box there and we will make sure that they get to our speaker. And today, I have the pleasure to introduce our speaker, Tom Karen. Tom, or TC, is a native of Lewiston who joined the New England Sports Network in 1995. So he's been a member of the network's team for 26 years now. For the past 20 seasons, he's been part of their Red Sox broadcast and has served as studio host since 2004. In addition to his Red Sox duties, Tom has served as a Red Sox field reporter, studio host for Boston Bruins hockey, and play-by-play -play announcer for the Hockey East Championships and Beanpot Tournament. Prior to the New England Sports Network, he was the play-by-play -play voice of the Portland Pirates of the AHL and was inducted into the team's Hall of Fame in 2014. An eight-time New England Emmy Award winner, Tom was named New England's favorite local TV sports personality seven times by Channel Media Sports Research's New England Sports Survey and was inducted into the Maine Sports Hall of Fame in September of 2021. He's involved in many local and regional charities, including Mass Mentoring, Good Sports Incorporated, the Run to Home Base Program, and the Red Sox Foundation. Without further ado, I am pleased to welcome Tom Karen home to Lewiston, virtually at least, and to the Great Falls Forum. Marcella, thanks so much. And thanks to everybody who uh, is part of this. I, I was a little worried. I saw the empty seats behind you there, but I guess that's okay when it's a virtual event like this. Uh, thanks everyone for taking a little time. I was trying to figure out where I fit in with Marcella's list, whether uh, I guess I must be under the arts because I'm certainly not a leader of business or public policy or anything like that. And I do want to say the timing for this, uh, and Marcella and I re rescheduled it <clears throat> a couple of times uh, the original thought was we would do it in early October because, you know, I mean, we all saw what was happening with the Red Sox and figured there would be no uh, interruptions. And then all of a sudden, things got a little crazy around Fenway Park over the last few weeks. And so we scheduled today because it's an off day in the World Series, which it is. But unfortunately, the Red Sox aren't part of that. So uh, what a ride it's been. And uh, I, I figured we'd have a little fun today, just talk a little about uh, the sports scene in Boston, uh, uh, what it means for everybody in, in Maine to be along for a ride like this. Uh, you know, as Marcel said, I, I born and raised in Lewis, Maine, Lewis in High School, uh, grew up on East Avenue across from the high school uh, where and my mom and dad were, were, were very involved in, in local politics. My mom was a, a warden uh, for the voting, for the polls uh, for, for decades. Uh, my dad was an alderman. Uh, we call him councilman down here. I think I have, there you go. I, I have his card in the background. There's my uh, my dad's elect Robert Karen for Alderman of Ward 7 card. So that's my, uh, that's my credentials, uh, my street cred uh, from Lewiston. And of course the uh, Muhammad Ali picture uh, always uh, stands proudly on the wall here from the, uh, uh, from, well, from the arena, right? We can call it whatever we want. It's the arena to those of us who know. Uh, so I, I grew up in Lewiston, um, went to college in Vermont, St. Michael's College in Vermont, uh, with the hope of being a sports writer. Uh, but it was uh, late in college where I sort of discovered television and, and got a couple opportunities there. And then, uh, you know, jumped around small markets as you do uh, Plattsburgh, New York and White River Junction, Vermont. And then finally got back to Maine uh, in the late 80s. Uh, I got to be a weekend anchor at, at, at Channel 13 WGME, uh, which was a thrill for me. 
working alongside uh, the great Frank Fixeris and learning from him, uh, who I grew up watching. And, you know, he used to always roll his eyes when I would say I grew up watching you. He said, you know, nothing makes you feel older. And I can confirm that now, uh, as Marcella said, been here 26 years. So uh, I just, somebody yesterday just told me they grew up watching me. And uh, I guess, I guess that's ultimately an honor uh, that you should accept. It makes you feel old, but it does make you realize that you've been doing it for a long time, which is a good thing in this business. Uh, but Channel 13 for, for five years, uh, left WGME to go uh, be the voice of the Portland Pirates for a couple of years. And, and from there got introduced to people at Nesson and got the opportunity uh, and have been there ever since, uh, doing a, a magazine show originally, then the Bruins, uh, and now the Red Sox uh, for, for a good long time. And, uh, and Marcella mentioned a couple of weeks ago, I was inducted into the Main Sports Hall of Fame, which is an incredible honor and uh, nothing I ever expected. Uh, I, I, I told the story at the time. Uh, Ryan Mulhern, uh, who was a great Portland Pirates player who went on to play for the Washington Capitals, uh, but wasn't with the Pirates when I was there. And when I got inducted into the Portland Pirates Hall of Fame, which was amazing because that was a, an event at Lewiston. It was the year they were playing their games at the Coliseum while the Civic Center and the, the Cross Insurance Arena was being, uh, was being renovated. Uh, so I got to be inducted into the, the, the Portland Pirates Hall of Fame uh, at Center Ice at the Coliseum, which was amazing. Uh, but, but after uh, they announced it, that I was uh, going to be inducted into that Hall of Fame, Ryan Mulhern called me. And, and I didn't know Ryan Mulhern. He hadn't played uh, when I was there. And he congratulated me. <clears throat> and I thought, what a classy thing uh, for this guy to reach out and, and congratulate me and welcome me to the Portland Pirates Hall of Fame. He said, I want to welcome you because I'm in there. And he goes, I also want to thank you. And I was like, what do you want to thank me for? And he goes, now I'll never have to worry about being the least talented hockey player to be in the Portland Pirates Hall of Fame. So uh, that was uh, very true. And uh, as I said, when I was inducted in the Main Sports Hall of Fame, I congratulated uh, everyone else who's being inducted and, and told them they could thank me because now they never have to worry about the least talented athlete in the main sports hall of fame. But as I said that day, one thing I have always tried to do uh, in this time at Nessie is, is to remember how important this sense of sports community is for everybody in New England. And I think here in Boston, we, we sometimes forget that. Um, you know, when I was a kid, I didn't get to Fenway Park or the Garden very often or Foxborough. My dad worked 37 years at Bath Ironworks and, and they would have an occasional bus trip that we would get to go on and go see a game. But, you know, the, the TV broadcasts were my my ticket, my conduit uh, to the event. I always felt like a, a, a portal into a bigger world when I was a kid in Lewis and Maine. And, and <clears throat> so now that I'm at, at Nesson and now that I've been at Nesson for a while, uh, I always try to remember and always try to relay to our audience that you know a championship this Red Sox run for the last few weeks few weeks uh, is every bit as important to people in in Lewiston or Bangor or Portland or Burlington Vermont or Berlin New Hampshire or Woonsocket Rhode Island uh, the, the good half the northern half of Connecticut uh, as it is to anybody in Boston and, and in some ways our TV broadcasts are maybe more important because it's not as easy for you to get down here it's it's two hours two and a half hours uh, if somebody bang or Presque Isle, it's even further, right? So uh, I always try to remember that, that watching us, watching these games, uh, that might be the only time they're really connecting with these teams. So uh, I've always felt, you know, even in, in a quarter century here, uh, I, not like a Bostonian, but like a Mainer uh, who's covering this team in Boston. And, and I think that's why, you know, I, I, I mean, people, you know, Jerry Remy and Dennis Eckersley roll their eyes. Oh, here we go. Another main story. Uh, uh, um, Ryan Flaherty, uh, whose dad, Ed Flaherty, is the <clears throat> coach at the University of Southern Maine. He had a, Ryan, his son, had a nice major league career play at the Orioles. Every time he got a hit, I'd have to show it on the postgame show. And they'd all roll their eyes. Yeah, we know. We know. He's from Maine and his dad's the coach. So I always try to uh, wave the Maine flag as best I can. Um, and so I, I want to talk about what's gone on here the last few weeks. But as I get into that, I, I want this to be as interactive as we can make it, uh, even though it's virtual. Uh, and I, I'm not big on giving a speech and then having a Q&A portion. I'd love to uh, interact and, and answer your questions now. So uh, the Q&A feature down on the bottom, right? You see the Q&A. Uh, go in there, type your question, uh, give me your name, uh, or just thought, or just connection, or whatever pops into your mind. Uh, and we'll weave all those into uh, the time we chat here. 
uh, as we go along. It's always great to hear what you're thinking. Uh, I believe you're watching on the uh, on the Facebook Live. You can uh, enter your question there. Someone's going to grab that and send it over to me on the Q&A as well. So uh, fire away and ask uh, any question you want. Uh, well, almost any question you want. And we'll, uh, we'll get to those as we go along. Uh, but this is the golden age of Boston sports. Uh, there has never been a time like this. Uh, when I got here in, in 1995, we were in the middle of a a 15 year stretch without a championship, uh, which seems incredible now uh, that these teams would go that long. From the 1986 Boston Celtics who won the NBA title to the 2001 Patriots, the 02 Super Bowl, uh, the, the, the you know, year Tom Brady took over after Drew Bledsoe got hurt. Uh, they, they won that Super Bowl obviously. So in between those two, it was 15 years without a championship. Uh, and now you think about it, uh, since, since that 2001 Patriots team, we've seen six Super Bowl championships for the Pats, four World Series championships for the Red Sox, uh, a Bruins Stanley Cup, a Celtics NBA title. Uh, it's just incredible the run of success we've had. And I always, I love to tell the story of, of one of the parades I've covered. I've, I've, I've had an amazing opportunity to cover a lot of parades now in Boston. And when you cover a parade, you know, you get there early. And uh, you get there, you know, they have like what they call the riser. It's the platform where the cameras and the reporters all set up in the morning for, for live coverage of the parade as it comes through. And, um, and once you're set up, you just kind of wait around, drinking your coffee for a few hours. And, and this family shows up kind of below the platform I'm on. And, and I hear this, uh, this kid say to his parents, hey, mom and dad, let's go stand where we always stand for these parades. And I'm looking over at them saying, think about that for a minute. You've got a usual place to watch championship parades. Go tell the people in Cleveland that you have a usual spot for parades. Uh, see how that goes over. So uh, it, it's, we, we've been so incredibly blessed uh, with this championship run. And, and you know, now uh, we go six months, we go a year without a championship. And it's easy to, uh, to suddenly get frustrated. And I'm like, I've heard one of my sons, uh, my sons are both in their 20s now. And I've heard, you know, one of them tell their friends, oh, you have no idea what it used to be like. Go ask my dad about the old days. Uh, these, are, these are great days now. Uh, and, and so it has been truly a remarkable run. Uh, and yet I always love the underdog stories. I think we all do, right? That's, that's generally why we love sports. And, and I think that's why this Red Sox season was so much fun because by and large, a lot of these championship years, uh, the teams were favorites. If not heavy favorites, they were one of the favorites. And this Red Sox team was coming off the worst season I've ever seen. I mean, that 2020 season uh, with COVID and no fans and no wins. I mean, it was just a horrible, it was the worst winning percentage in, in, in 65 years. Uh, dead last place and and no real uh, hope of getting out of it by the end of last year. But you know, Chaim Bloom is the new general manager, and chief baseball officer, and and you know he kind of stuck his guns and and built without any big splashes, but picked up pieces at the margin that he thought could really help this team. And boy, did they ever! Uh, and and you know they stormed out the first half, had a lead at the All Star break, and at that point it was fair to expect them to go deep. But I think even then we didn't think they'd go as deep as they did. And then certainly over the second half, uh, the way this team uh, ran the trouble. First the COVID thing, which was not good for anybody, as you know, uh, they were one of only six teams in Major League Baseball that didn't reach the 85 percent vaccination threshold. Which once you get to that eases up some of the restrictions. So this team uh, was, was bound by restrictions and that wasn't a good look for the team. And then they had that huge uh, COVID outbreak. Now, again, was it because they were unvaccinated? I don't know. The Yankees had a huge outbreak earlier in the year and they were one of the most vaccinated teams in baseball. So I don't want to blame it on them, but it certainly didn't help. And it certainly wasn't a good look. I know one player specifically was unvaccinated and he was a close contact, didn't have it. But in baseball, if you were a close contact and you were vaccinated, you didn't miss any time. In his case, he was a close contact and he was not vaccinated. So he had to miss like six, seven days. He was a pitcher they needed, Josh Taylor, a really important left-handed reliever. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's unfortunate because the Red Sox as an organization were really good in pushing it. They use Fenway Park as a, as a vaccine site, as a vaccination center. 
Uh, Alex Cora, before the season even began, uh, did a number of public service announcements to try to get people to, to get their vaccinations. So I, I thought it was really disappointing that the team didn't. And, and when they went through, it was basically 14 players put on the COVID-related injured list in a 12-day span. Uh, early September. And and I thought that was the end of the season. I really did. I thought there was no getting back from this. If you remember, there was a, I think it was the end of August, there was a game in Tampa Bay where Alex Cora had actually come out on the field top of the third inning and bring Xander Bogart, their best player, in off the field because they had just gotten a positive test result. You're putting your best player off the field in the middle of a game. And that really felt like the low point of the season. Uh, but to Cora's credit, he's got an amazing way to to get players to believe in themselves. That's why I think he was the right guy to bring back for this job. Uh, gave this team a, a dose of confidence that I think it sorely lacked after last year. So, so he brought them back together and somehow got them to play their best baseball at the end of the season. Uh, a playoff run that began with the elimination of the New York Yankees. And I said then, and I will say now, that if you eliminate the Yankees from the playoffs, whatever else you do, it's been a successful season. Uh, but they didn't just quit there. They eliminated the Rays, uh, who were the best team in the American League, 100 wins. And then you get to the frustrating part. They had a 2-1 series lead and uh, were leading going into the eighth inning of game four, six outs away from taking a 3-1 to one lead. And, and the bats went quiet and were never heard from again. Uh, stunningly scoring just one run over the final 26 innings of baseball uh, after they had scored 18 runs in the previous two games. Uh, just went ice cold. Uh, amazing adjustments by the Astros. Uh, and, and the Astros offense woke up in the ninth inning of game four and never looked back. And, and now they're even in the World Series. So it's a strange season to sort of put in perspective, because if you go back to the beginning of the season, I think there's no doubt this was a wildly successful year for the Boston Red Sox. But if you go to where they were, uh, and I'm still in a fog over my days, but if you go where they were uh, a week ago Monday, uh, they were leading the series, looked like they had uh, Houston down and out. Uh, and somehow they let that get away and, uh, and, and didn't win the pennant. So uh, it, it's going to be interesting over time how we look back on this season. Of course, a lot of it is going to have to do with where they go from here. And we'll talk about that. I think they're in a good place. But we do have some questions for again. So I do want to jump in on these as we go. Uh, beginning with Amy Bass, whose book is up there on the shelf somewhere. Uh, what moments have you found yourself feeling more like a fan than a broadcaster? It's a great question, Amy, uh, who is a great Red Sox fan. Uh, Amy uh, uh, and her family certainly uh, uh, understand, uh, you know, what a jersey like this means on the wall. You know, it is funny because when you cover a team, you try, you try not to be a fan. Uh, you, you try to watch somewhat dispassionately. But it's, you know, listen, I mean, I grew up here, a Red Sox fan, right? And the people watching us are Red Sox fans. So it's not, uh, it, it's, it's, it's not a leap when uh, that fandom comes out in me. And, uh, and, and so, uh, I mean, the, the biggest moment of all is the 04 World Series. Um, you know, this, the story, the, the, fa the Karen family story, and my parents have passed. Uh, but in 1986, I was working my first job in Plattsburgh, New York. And I was working Saturday nights at the NBC affiliate in, uh, in Plattsburgh. And we had the World Series, it was NBC. And so uh, the Bill Buckner game, uh, game six of the 1986 World Series was on a Saturday night. So uh, I was coming on the air right after the Buckner game. Uh, game six, they lose, I, I don't wanna go there again. It's a little easier to go there now that they've won a few. But I, I came on the air and, and, and so before going on the air, Several times, three times to be exact, the Red Sox were one strike away from ending that game and winning the World Series. And each time, the old rotary phone, each time they got to two strikes, I would dial 207, 78, I won't say the rest, uh, but but calling my family. So right as they won the World Series, I would get on the phone. I'd say, yeah, my parents were watching it with my family and they're all, we all have that moment. And then I'd run out to the studio and do my thing. <laughs> well, each time I hung up because they never did get that third strike. And, and I never did make that call. And so we said, when they win the World Series, I'll call. That was kind of the running thing. 2004, uh, I'm, I'm running out to the studio, and now we have cell phones. So I, I call my parents who are, you know, my sisters were there, and everybody's celebrating and, and having that great moment. And I'm talking to them, finally having that call, you know, from uh, 86 to, uh, to, to 04, the long time coming. 
and and I hang up and right as we get in the studio, my phone rings and it's my wife, Kelly, from Lewiston as well. Uh, and and she's calling with our eight-year-old son uh, as they're watching, celebrating. And, and my, you know, <clears throat> at that moment, my dad was in his 80s, I was in my 40s, and Jack was eight. And uh, it was the first World Series in all three of our lifetimes. So three generations uh, of us, of, of, of Karens uh, from, from Maine, who had never been alive uh, for a World Series championship. My dad used to say, I was born in 1921, so I just missed the last one by a couple of years. Uh, and, and like a lot of other people, he said, now I can die in peace. I was like, well, don't, because they might win some more. And sure enough, they kept winning in 07 and again in 13 and 18. So and those moments you love as a fan. Um, she also, Amy also asked any athletes who stick out, uh, you know, over the years. I mean, we just, I don't know if you got to see it. It's going to air again. Uh, check your local listings, as we say. Um, but we just did a special with David Ortiz where he and I sat down for an hour and looked back on his ridiculous run in the 2013 World Series when he hit 667. Uh, and they wound up walking him six times over the last two games. They just stopped even trying to pitch to him because they knew he could pitch with just whatever they threw, he was going to hit. <clears throat> and so that, uh, those times with Big Poppy, uh, Pedro Martinez is someone I've got to know a little bit. And uh, he was just, you know, not only the fiercest competitor I've ever known, but just a really thoughtful athlete, a guy who, who you know, would think about what he was doing on the mound. It wasn't just God-given skill. Uh, he was a guy who, who tried to outthink uh, his opponents, and uh, I, I love talking baseball with him. It was his birthday this week, and uh, I kind of shared a little time on social media, but um, some of those guys, uh, you know, were just uh, larger than life. I mean, the 04 Sox, the 03 04 Sox that I got to be around, 03, I was the sideline reporter and was traveling with the team, so really got to know a lot of those guys really well, and they were just such an incredible group. Uh, the group that overcame, you know, for the three nothing deficit against the Yankees. No way you could do that without without uh, you know being able to sort of shrug off the weight of history, right? And and from Ortiz and and Manny Ramirez and Johnny Damon to the pitchers, you know, Pedro Martinez and and Derek Lowe and and Keith Folk and Kurt Schilling, you know, these guys, um, <clears throat> Jason Veritek, obviously the ultimate captain. You know, they, they, were, they were crazy enough uh, to not know how difficult, in fact, impossible up until then, it was to come back from a 3 nothing deficit. No one had ever done it. No one has done it since in a, in a uh, best-of-seven baseball series, uh, but also confident enough that they could do it. And Terry Francona was such a great manager for that team, uh, someone who could, you know, uh, guide uh, the craziness uh, Johnny Damon wrote his book uh, called the idiots because uh, that's what they called themselves they were the idiots they were they were in their minds they weren't smart enough to, to understand how hard it was but they were exactly as smart as they needed to be uh, as they you know that Dave that Dave Roberts steal uh, of second base in, in game four uh, against the Mariano Rivera, the great Mariano Rivera, who threw over to first base three times and had Roberts diving back and diving back. You go back and watch that stolen base. It's incredible how close it is. He's out there, series over, Red Sox lose, swept by the Yankees. Uh, Terry Francona said to me once, we were watching it years later, and he said, man, every time I watch this, it gets even closer. I feel one of these years I'm going to watch it, he's going to be out, and none of it ever happened. Like that, it gets closer every year. Uh, and it's no, you know, Dave Roberts managing the Dodgers, they just lost. But no surprise that that Dave Roberts and Gabe Kapler and Alex Cora and Kevin Cash, four of the final eight managers in the playoffs, uh, were all Red Sox uh, players under Terry Francona, kind of that Terry Francona managing tree. So many people learned. And then you look around baseball. I was talking to Jed Hoyer the other day. He was at Fenway, the general manager or president of baseball operations now of the Chicago Cubs, uh, one of many executives who learned under Theo Epstein in that same era. So that, uh, that baseball group, 02, 03, 04, 05, 06, all the way to 07, really, uh, kind of grew into a lot of guys who are, are managing and, and running baseball operations now and overseeing uh, a lot of operations around baseball. So it really speaks to, uh, to, uh, to, to what that group meant. So 
Uh, let's go to another question. It must be exhausting to do play by play. How do you keep uh, up your energy and your voice? You kind of hear that I'm coughing now. I hope that's not why you're asking. Uh, that's Ron Jakes. Uh, thank you, Ron. Um, yeah, it's, you know, it's a, and as I've gotten older, I, I, I almost feel like I have more allergies now than I ever did, uh, seasonal allergies that you kind of deal with every spring almost. Um, but it's like anything else you learn. Uh, it's just not smart to, uh, to go to a bar and yell over the music at a bar, uh, cause you will be in trouble the next day. So, uh, I avoid loud crowded bars. Uh, if you're going to go out, go out to a nice small little restaurant or pub where you can have a quiet conversation. Uh, you do a lot of vocal exercises like anything else. Uh, and, and most of all, you know, I just always feel that the, the one thing I've always had is energy. And, and I, I try to bring that to the air. I, I try to bring that to the broadcast every night. Uh, you know, sometimes you pinch yourself. I'm a kid from Lewiston, right? The, the t-shirt's just a kid from, I'm just a kid from Lewiston, Maine. And yeah, you know, walking to work and there's Jim Rice uh, yelling over to me, uh, you know, the Hall of Famer, or there, you know, Dennis Eckersley just called me a little bit ago before I came on uh, to talk about the World Series and, and you know, you pinch yourself sometimes because it's just crazy that uh, that I've managed to become uh, uh, not just coworkers, but friends with some of these guys, some of the greatest uh, in baseball history. So uh, I, I just figure I can bring energy every night. Um, I, I still am, you know, the fan that uh, that, that Amy asked about at heart. And uh, when, I, when I stop loving these games, I guess I'll stop doing it. But this, the beauty of it is, and the beauty of baseball is it's just such a, Soap opera is the wrong word expression, I guess, because soap opera makes it sound like there's drama and it's not that, but it's just, it's like a soap opera because it's just a daily story that takes twists and turns that you can't believe. I mean, but, you know, it is the original, sports TV is the original reality television, right? There's no scripting. Uh, there's no, there's no planning in advance and, and watching, you know, some of these incredible seasons come together. I have been beyond belief. I mean, I, and again, you think about this season, and I'm going to put this up there uh, as, as one of the most exciting seasons I've covered. The 03 season is one I always think back to, and that wasn't one of their championship seasons. But I was there at Yankee Stadium when Aaron Boone hit the home run in the 11th inning of the seventh game against Tim Wakefield, eliminating the Red Sox. And the old Yankee Stadium was just bouncing, and I was in the locker room after the game and had to fly home with the team. Uh, but that was that team was remarkable because you back it up, and, and, you know, they were down 2 nothing in the best of five series against Oakland to begin that postseason. It came all the way back and, and had the battle. That was the cowboy up here, if you recall it all. Uh, <clears throat> so this year, there's no doubt I'm looking back at this year as, as something special uh, because they absolutely overcame the odds. Uh, and, and again, um, you know, they, I mean, that, think about the last day of the season, October 3rd. They were taking the field in Washington having lost uh, uh, four of their last six. And, and had they lost that day, it would have ended up, they would have been in a, a tie with Toronto for the second wild card. They would have to play that Monday with the winner going Tuesday to New York to face the Yankees. Before the day began, Seattle was there and it could have been a three-way tie, in which case you would have had a game like Monday in uh, Boston and then potentially Tuesday in Seattle. And then Wednesday in New York for the wild card. Uh, and, and so we're just going through all these scenarios. And they were down in that game five to one, trailing five to one in that final game of the season, needing to win to qualify for the playoffs. They come from behind when Raphael Devers, a two-run home run in the eighth inning, gives them the lead. And then all of a sudden, they just roll over the Yankees, which is at Fenway Park, thankfully, because John Carlos Stanton absolutely crushed three balls. One was a homer. The other two were off the top of the green monster by about my head, uh, which, which is, you know, seven and three quarters. I mean, it's a large head. But uh, came that close to, to, to being home runs. Would have changed everything. If they were at Yankee Stadium. They would have all been home runs. Would have been three home runs. So home field advantage became huge. Uh, so it's remarkable what they did and how far they got uh, and, and how they really were patching together uh, the pitching. I mean, Chris Sale wasn't himself. We'll see where that goes uh, next year. Uh, they had uh, relievers who were faltering. So I, it's, listen, it's all Alex Cora to me. Alex Cora managed this team to be better than the sum of its parts and got them a whole lot further. So uh, really a, uh, a remarkable run 
for this team. Uh, Steve Costello writing in. Hey, Steve, uh, what is your prediction for the Red Sox next year? Great question. Uh, I, I mentioned uh, Chris Sale, and I'll start there because uh, next year is the year to me. Chris Sale regains his dominance at the top of the major league, uh, uh, a major league rotation with the Red Sox. Uh, when, you, when you get Tommy John surgery, as he had, uh, it's generally that second year after coming back where you get back to being who you are. So he'll have this off season, uh, be ready to go for full spring training to build up his strength. And I expect Chris Sale to be an ace again next year. And, and I love Nate Evaldi. He's one of my favorite guys on this team. Uh, not just a great pitcher, but a, a great family guy, uh, has uh, served as the honorary captain of the Jimmy Fund for the last few years. So does a lot of work with us on the Jimmy Fund Radio Telethon, just a, a real high character individual. And, and I think when you've got guys like Sale and Evaldi at the top of the rotation, uh, you're in great shape. Uh, next year, I think Tanner Houck is ready for a breakout year. We saw glimpses of it this year. He'll be back in the rotation, I think. It's going to work on a third pitch. Uh, I think it's a, kind of a split finger change uh, to go along with this fastball and wipe out slider. When he gets that third pitch, I think he'll be able to have a lot of success at the major league level. I think next spring training is when he'll put the finishing touches on that. Uh, good young pitcher that rounds out that rotation. And I think Garrett Whitlock, which you love to see because they got him in the Rule 5 draft from the New York Yankees, minor leaguer who the Yankees didn't put on their 40-man roster, was exposed in that draft, and the Red Sox grabbed him. He was outstanding out of the bullpen this year, but throughout his minor league career had been a uh, starter before Tommy John surgery. I think Whitlock comes back as a starter. So if you start looking at the rotation, as Sale, Evaldi, Hauk, and Whitlock, that's a really good place to be. Now, Eduardo Rodriguez, I feel bad for the guy because in 2019, he finished, I think, sixth in the Cy Young voting, had 19 wins over 200 innings, uh, breakthrough year, one of the best young pitchers in the game, 26 years old at the time. Uh, then last year, the COVID, he was one of the first positive cases, got developed myocarditis, didn't throw a pitch the entire year. And, and like for three months, couldn't do more than walk. I mean, even couldn't walk at a brisk pace, could not get his heart rate elevated at all. Uh, and you think about what that does to an athlete missing not just the competition of a year, but any training, any, any working out, uh, there's no doubt it had an effect on him this year. And he had a good year, not a great year. It was an inconsistent year. It was up and down. But the problem here is he's a free agent now. And uh, if you're the Red Sox, are you willing to pay premium money for a guy who, who, who was up and down? I, I think you got to be careful there. I love Eduardo Rodriguez. I really do. I hope he's back. And I think he will be if his price tag is low enough, depending on what the – the market is for him. Um, but if not him, they'll have to get someone else. Nick Pavetta was a really, really good starting pitcher for this team this year. And, and if you watch the playoffs at all, he was incredible out of the bullpen. Uh, the 13 inning game at Fenway against the Rays, which they won, he went four innings, obviously of extra innings baseball in the playoffs. So you talk about the ultimate high leverage situation. Uh, and, and, and he was dominant and emotional, high stepping off the mound, doing kicks, screaming into his glove after striking guys out, crowd was going nuts. Uh, and so I think what I saw there is a guy who could really be an amazing closer for this team. And I, I'm sure he doesn't want that. I'm sure he wants to be a starting pitcher, but I saw flashes, of Jonathan Papelbon, uh, at his best. And I saw Nick Pavetta as a guy with, with emotion and energy and intensity and a nasty fastball uh, that could come out in the ninth inning and lock teams down. So uh, if I were the Red Sox, I'd be certainly talking to him about doing that uh, and, and finding another starter for that rotation. And, and then you got to put together the bullpen, but every team has to put together the bullpen every year. Matt Barnes, it was a disappointing second half, shocking. Um, they moved him into the closers role. He was outstanding the first half all-star game for the first time. And then almost overnight, uh, his numbers go the other way uh, to the point where he wasn't even on the ALCS roster, wasn't on the playoff roster for the last round. Uh, and so they got to get him back together. A little easier to do that as a seventh inning or eighth inning guy than a closer. So uh, if you had someone else closing, I think, uh, I think Matt Barnes uh, could re refine himself uh, as a setup guy before uh, before uh, someone else takes over as the closer. So, uh, you know, Devers and Bogarts are back. They're the cornerstones 
of this offense. Uh, the outfield, uh, we'll see. I mean, Kike Hernandez wound up being great in center field. I think they'd love to have him there again. Christian Arroyo is a really good second baseman if he can stay healthy, but he hasn't been able to stay healthy. Verdugo and Renfro should be back as your corner outfielders. The interesting guy is Kyle Schwarber. He was so good after they got him in the trade. Uh, but he's not a natural first baseman. Now, I think given spring training, he could develop the skills to be an adequate sec, uh, first baseman, but that would be blocking Bobby Dahlbeck. So maybe Dahlbeck's someone you look at in a trade. Uh, if you're up there, you should know about Tristan Cassis. He played most of the year in Portland, played for the U.S. Olympic team, and, and people are raving about him, saying this guy is going to be a big-time impact major league hitter, and I bet you'll see him in Boston mid to late next season. Uh, and, and so, again, that also factors in with what you're doing with Dahlbeck. He's, they're both first basemen. Schwarber would be a first baseman if J.D. Martinez is back. J.D. Martinez can opt out uh, after the season, which officially would be sometime next week when the World Series ends. Uh, he's due $19.5 million for the Red Sox. But with the National League most likely getting a designated hitter next year, you're going to have all those NL teams looking for a DH. So he might want to opt out and get a multi-year deal because uh, he only got one year left. So I wouldn't be surprised if that happens over the Red Sox, uh, if he opts back in, if the Red Sox maybe consider trading him and making Schwarber the DH. Uh, so that's a long answer, Steve, to your question. I think they'll be good. I think, you know, they're, the Yankees have the usual question about their pitching. Uh, the Rays are good, not great. I think the Red Sox, no, the Blue Jays scared the hell out of me. That's the team uh, with Vlad Guerrero Jr. And, and, and Biggio, and they've got all these, you know, these legacy players, it's unbelievable uh, what these guys have been doing. And then they added Springer, who was out for most of the year. I think that team is going to be just mashing the ball next year again. Uh, and so I think it's going to be another, it's the best division in baseball, the American League East. And I think it will be again next year. Uh, but I think the Red Sox there. And I will say this last thing. One thing that happened over this postseason run is Fenway Park came to life again this team has come back to life where baseball has been kind of dead and quiet for a few years uh those playoff crowds were were as loud and engaged and and you know energized as as any group i've seen here in in 10 years or more at fenway uh and i i don't know why uh, the team was likable and and it was an underdog so so they jumped on uh, the bandwagon, but I, I think some of it is, you know, listen, the, the betting uh, that's allowed now, not still in Massachusetts, not legal here, but uh, baseball is a great sport for, for prop bets. You know, you can bet on each at bat now through the apps. You know, this guy's going to hit a home run. Uh, what are the odds? This guy, you know, so people are engaged in that way. But I also think it's just a younger crowd than we've had in a while. The Red Sox had $9 college student tickets this year, and they sold a lot of them. Uh, and, and so those young people started having a good time at Fenway and coming back. So I, I think the biggest thing about next year is I think it, the energy is going to be back and, and the crowd's going to be back to life. Uh, and I think Fenway Park is going to be uh, the place to be uh, next year. So I think the team will be good and I think the fans are going to be great uh, to spur them on. Uh, don't forget, you can ask a question on the Q&A uh, feature down at the bottom of your screen. We have one here from Aaron Morse. Asking, what's your typical day like during the season preparing for the pregame and postgame shows? Does it change when the team is on the road? Yes. Uh, so there, the beauty of this is there is no typical day. Uh, days are, uh, you know, there's no nine to five uh, when you work baseball, certainly. Uh, I, the, the biggest difference is the home and road. Uh, when you're home, you just, you're, you're there earlier because you're beating you're talking to players, you try to get there for some of the early batting practice and, and you want to be around the coaches and talk to them a little bit, see what's going on. Uh, and you just have to deal with traffic and parking and all that stuff. Our studios are in Watertown, a few miles from Fenway. Uh, so when they're on the road, it's a little easier. I go in later. Um, but if, you know, if you think about a, a, a home game, I, I try to be there by three for a seven o'clock game. Um, and then on, right now, in the regular season, we drive back to Watertown sometime during the game and do the postgame show in the studio. Now, next year, this is pretty exciting. We have a brand new studio that's being built up above the center field bleachers, looking back into the ballpark. It's going to be glassed in. It's going to be fantastic. I can't wait. Uh, and, and so we'll do the post games there as well. Uh, so that'll be a little different when we have to drive back to, uh, to Watertown for the postgame show. But yeah, yeah the, the typical day is you go in, Homer Road and, and you go over the notes and you talk to people either, you know, in person at Fenway or via Zoom like this, uh, 
Alex Cora has a little media briefing with a few of us every day, sort of tell us what's going on. We can ask questions, uh, find out about lineup decisions and player status and all that stuff. Uh, and so you go through all that and meet with the producers, kind of put the show together based on those meetings. Here's what's going on. What are we going to do? What video are we going to show? What graphics do we want to build? Um, <clears throat> by then, the, the, the analyst is in or analysts whoever they are, and, and we've got great ones. And, and one of the things I love working about Nesson, uh, one of the things I love about working at Nesson is I get to work with, with such great analysts from, from, from Jerry Remy and Dennis Eckersley up in the booth to Jim Rice and, and Tim Wakefield and Lenny DiNardo uh, in studio. Um, this year we had Kevin Euclid and Mo Vaughn and Jonathan Papelbon all doing a uh, 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 remote stuff like this uh, via Skype, Zoom, uh, where they would come on and Pat Bond actually came in studio for the playoffs. So we have a great, uh, a great stable of, of analysts who are uh, really, really good at what they do. They've taught me a lot about the game. Uh, and, and again, it's just a, a pleasure to work with them. So, uh, you know, you go, through, you go through the pregame stuff. You do the pregame show. Pregame shows are kind of structured because – you know, you put it together and you do it. Then you watch the game, the best part of the job. You get to watch a baseball game. Uh, and, and we, you know, we joke for the studio people, it's, it's, you know, the first three innings, you're eating dinner and kind of watching to see what the game evolves into. The middle three innings, you're kind of putting together uh, the show based on how the game is playing out. And by then you have a pretty good idea what the starting pitcher is doing, what the offense is doing, where are you? And in the last three innings, you're holding off a dear life to see if uh, it takes a drastic turn. Uh, and those are my favorite shows. When, when uh, a closer blows a, a save at the end and all of a sudden runs score and the whole game flips up down down, we throw out the entire show we put together and just go running out on the air and try to react to that. I love those because it's, uh, that's where the, uh, the, the great sort of emotion and energy comes. Uh, instead of sitting around, you know, seven to one uh, lead in the fourth inning and you just wait for the end of the game and that's another two hours sometimes. Because uh, that is one thing about baseball, as you know. Uh, it is a long game. So we sit around for a long time. There's a lot of coffee uh, that is consumed over the course of a baseball season. Uh, I think they will do some things to speed that up in the years they come. That, that'll be good news. Uh, Aaron, thank you for that question. Um, I do think that things like uh, the pitch clock, <clears throat> you know, they've already had uh, some rules that we've seen that have marginally <clears throat> helped pick up the pace of the game a little bit. And it's not so much the length of the game, even though they are too long, uh, because I think there are some great games that last forever. That 13 inning game I talked about at Fenway. I don't remember how long it is, how long it was, but it was a very long game, but it was fabulous. We could have gone all night. Helped that it was a five o'clock start because it wasn't too late. Had it been a, a seven or eight o'clock start, that would have been a very long night. <clears throat> but it's not so much, I think, it's not so much the Length of game as it is the pace of play. Major League Baseball has a problem that not enough balls are being put into play, not enough action is happening over the course of the game. Uh, in baseball, we talk a lot now about the three true outcomes, which is a home run, a walk, or a strike, strikeout. Uh, and and when all those happen, two out of the three, nothing's happening. A strikeout and a walk, nothing's happening. And this pitch guy goes to first. The pitch guy goes back to the dugout. Strikeouts are exciting when there's guys on and you need them. Uh, but by and large, it's a, it's a moment and it's over. Even a home run. It's exciting when he gets exciting and then it's over. Baseball needs more of is ground balls and, and balls put in play in the outfield where fielders are playing and moving because it's an amazing game. Now, watching a double play, the grace and athleticism that these guys uh, display is, is truly remarkable. Uh, it's what you see in other sports, basketball, hockey, the, the fluidity, the action, football. Uh, baseball needs more action. So the pace of play, the, the, the product on the field is what needs to be improved. And, and, and I think baseball will continue to address that. Um, we've seen even little things like the reliever having to come in to face a minimum of three batters in an inning and has uh, kept it from being – all right, you bring in the right hand to face right hander. Here comes the manager another time. Left hand to face left hander. Here comes the manager. Right hander, right hander. Here comes yeah. Commercial, 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 which is good for us paying uh, uh, you know uh, TV stations having to pay the bills, uh, but not great for the for the live audience or for anybody watching on TV. Right, you click, you move. Um, so I, I think they do need to uh, 
to figure that out, how to keep that going. Uh, and Aaron just jumped back in with another question about banning the shift. Should they ban the shift? Is that a strategy they should keep? I am 100% uh, percent in favor. I don't know if banning is the right word, but legislating the shift is what I prefer. So here you go. I'll get on my soap operas on, on Tom Karen's ways to uh, improve baseball. One is give the home plate umpire technology. Now, if you watch these playoff games, if you watch the ninth inning of game four, Nathan Abaldi, the starter, came in and relieved. He gave up a leadoff double. Then he worked around a walk with a couple of strikeouts. He had strike three called or he had strike three, which should have been called by the umpire Laz Diaz, who did not call it a strike. And if you watch, Laz Diaz was set up over on the right shoulder of the catcher near the left-handed hitter, peeking in between them. Ivaldi threw a pitch that came in from the other side and cut it over the plate. It was clear. It wasn't even close. It was clearly a strike. But because of where he set up, he didn't see it. And, and I, you know, I go on Twitter all the time and, you know, here, hashtag robot umps. But it's not really robot umps. You need umpires behind the plate. You need a human umpire behind the plate to call boundary calls and, and save an out at home. But he ought to have, and I, I've said this a million times, he ought to have a device in his hand that buzzes when the baseball breaks the plane of the strike zone, right? The same thing we all watch, the, the uh, Amica strike zone, whatever we call it on Nesson. We have one, K-Zone on ESPN, uh, Fox has, everybody has one. So you at home watch it. I, I'm on Twitter. I follow four different umpire rating feeds who will tell you the calls they blow. So everybody watching the game has that technology to them. Literally everybody in the world has the ability to see if the technology says it's a strike, except for one guy, and that's the guy calling the strike or ball. So give him something that buzzes when it says it crosses the plate. Now, I would give them the leeway to still not call it a strike. Technology isn't perfect. And if you believe with your eyes that that was not a strike, don't call it. Because they're getting judged right now anyway uh, on that technology. Uh, Major League Baseball goes back and grades the umpires and talks to them. So they might as well at least have the information. They might as well at least know what we're all going to see and, and not wait till they go home and flip on ESPN to find out that everybody's ripping them for the blown call. Why not give them the information we all have? It's not that hard. Let them have that little extra information. That's what number one. Number two, back to your question, Aaron, legislate the shifts. Pretty simple has to be two infielders on each side of the bag. You can go right up to the bag. Here's second base in the middle. You have two guys standing next to each other, hugging if you want. But you can't have three on one side of the bag and one on the other. I, I don't know how many times now I see somebody actually absolutely smoke a ball to short right field. That's a base hit at every level of baseball except Major League Baseball because the shortstop is camped out in short right field. And the second baseman is the shortstop's over at second base. You got, a, a, you know, student body right alignment. Uh, between first and second base. So I, it, it's not, you know, two guys on each side, uh, the late Nick Capardo, the great baseball writer uh, who we lost too soon for the Boston Globe. Uh, he and I would argue on this forever uh, because he was a purist and he didn't want uh, any rule like that. But you know what? Every other sport has rules like that, right? You can't camp out in the paint for three seconds or more than three seconds in a, in a basketball game. And you can't go hang out in front of the net in a hockey game while your teammates go back to the defensive zone to get the puck. You'll be offside. you got to come out. Football players can't go lunging across the line of scrimmage before the snap. Certain position players can't do certain things. There are ineligible uh, receivers and, and, and so on and so forth. So every other sport legislates where their athletes can and can't be. It's not a shock for baseball to have to do the same thing. So, so two guys on each side of their infield, and they got to be on the dirt. Infielders can't go out in the outfield. They can't have four outfielders, five outfielders, or whatever. Um, so that's rule number two. Rule number three is the pitch clock. It works in the minor leagues. I think it's 21 minutes on average taken off a game at the minor league level by the introduction of the pitch clock. So bring in the pitch clock, uh, speed up the game. I've talked to a lot of pitchers that come to the major league levers, never bothered them. And it's only when there's nobody on base. When there's runners on base, the clock's gone. You slow it down because you got to concentrate. You got to do what you got to do. Uh, and and this is no mound visits. That's number four. Get rid of all mound visits. Why? Why do we? If you go to the mound, take the guy out of the game. Why do you need a mound visit? Can you imagine? Can you imagine a football game 
Uh, like, can you? I just when Tom Brady was here, imagine, imagine Bill Belichick just coming out during a drive and having a quick conversation with Tom Brady while he massages his shoulder and tells him that you know it's going to be okay. We see that all the time, and that's that's that's. I talk about pace of play. There's no pay. There's no play. It's just all stop because the the pitching coach is out there having a conversation with the pitcher. What's he telling him? Throw strikes. If you can't throw strikes, take him out of the game. So there you go. You get rid of uh, you get rid of all mound visits, or or at least maybe you met one or two. It's like a timeout, right? What do what do what do they, you get? Two timeouts, three timeouts, a half. So you get you get two visits a game. Right now they get six. It's too many. You don't need mound visits. That includes catchers. Catchers don't go out there. Um, so there you go. I think I, I, yeah yeah yeah. Umpires get the technology. You legislate the shift. You get a pitch clock, and you get uh, and you get. Uh, no mound visits or very few mound visits. I think that would be a great place to start to uh, not only help speed up the game and uh, to help uh, improve the pace of play, but, uh, but, I, but I think just make it a better game. Now, their collective bargaining agreement is coming to an end. It ends in December. And that's the agreement between the union and the game uh, and, and Major League Baseball. It's frightening to think that there could even be consideration of a work stoppage because this this game would be in serious trouble if there is any kind of strike or lockout that impacts next next season. I haven't heard anything much about the negotiations, and I'm going to take that as a good thing because I generally feel when you're negotiating in public, it's not going well. Uh, so I hope that there is uh, uh, you know a good exchange of ideas going on quietly behind the scenes, and that they come to a way to to continue this game. It's a great game. It's a nine, ten billion dollar industry. If you can't figure out how to how to cut up that money, uh, give me a call and I'll, I'll give you a plan uh, for just, you know, a few hundred million. Uh, but I, you know, I just hope they can figure that out because it's a great sport. I think it's, like I said, especially in Boston, I think it's regaining a foothold with the younger audience uh, and it would just be a devastating time to pull the plug on this, even for a little while, people are going to move on and, and baseball will never come back. And I hope they're smart enough to figure that out. I think they are. Uh, but I've seen, I've seen leagues drive it all off the cliff before. Um, so I hope that doesn't happen. <clears throat> so I uh, got time for a couple last questions. If anybody wants to jump in before we go uh, while we do this, I will say um, that uh, it is interesting now, as we talk about this golden age of Boston sports, to see where it all goes now, right? Red, uh, Patriots uh, have a losing record, though they look pretty good against the Jets, but it's the Jets. So everybody looks pretty good against the Jets. So we won't get too carried away yet. Need to see them do it against better teams. Uh, Celtics, uh, Bruins struggling out of the gate right now. Red Sox were an unexpected joy. If you're a soccer fan, I know Amy Bass is, and, and I certainly am, uh, but if you're a uh, if you're talking about the New England Revolution, are worth your attention right now. They just put together the best regular season in MLS history, and uh, have the national team goalkeeper in uh, in in Matt Turner, who's a great guy and a really good goalkeeper. Uh, so they're a team that's going to make a run here, and you should jump on the bandwagon before it's too late. Uh, all right, we're gonna we'll finish on this question. It's a good one. Steve Collins asking uh, why the Ali photo on your wall. What does that mean to you? Well, obviously. Uh, that is the uh, Ali Liston photo from Lewiston, Maine, where I am from. Uh, I, I didn't get to see the fight. I was, I don't know, a year old. Uh, so I, I wouldn't have remembered seeing the fight. I will say uh, my father was uh, a volunteer in what they call back then the civil defense police. Uh, and, and they were asked to, uh, to, to direct traffic in the city uh, for the fight. When the heavyweight fight came, when the heavyweight title came to uh, Lewiston, Maine. And the deal was you could direct traffic and then come in and watch the fight. So he's out there directing traffic, people going in, all of a sudden cars coming out, he's directing traffic. He's like, what's going on? Oh, the fight's over. Phantom punch. Uh, and, and everything that went behind that, it was a very short, very quick night. So my dad never got in to see the fight. Uh, it's still amazing to me uh, that, that a heavyweight championship bout was in our great city of Lewiston, Maine. And that, that's really cool. I know there's a, a lot of weird stuff that went down that night from Robert Goulet and the Anthem to, uh, to Howard Cosell's uh, treatment of the city and his opening remarks. Uh, but still, what, a, what an amazing thing uh, to be able to say. And uh, when I'm down here in Boston, when people hear from Lewiston, that's usually uh, people old enough, people my age, one of the first things they'll ask is about that. I will also point this one out. This is my father's. 
uh, batting title trophy when he played for the Lewiston Mohawks of the old industrial league uh, back in the day. So I think that was when he was 18 or 19 before going off to World War II. So there's, there you go. That's my little Lewiston along with my, uh, my dad's alderman uh, ad. Um, so I guess we'll wrap it up there on the, uh, on the uh, Lewiston uh, remarks. Uh, I do want to thank you uh, so much for having me. This was very cool. I wish we could do it in person. So I will promise Marcella that we will do this again someday in person when I can take questions. Uh, but but enjoy it. Uh, remember it's sports and uh, it's it's fun. Uh, just try to have fun. Okay, Red Sox were frustrating when they lost, but uh, what a great ride they gave us. And uh, it's only 111 days until pitchers and catchers report to spring training. So have a good winter, I guess. Well, thank you, Tom. We really appreciate your time today. I know it's been a you're probably a little exhausted <laughs> from the past few weeks. So we really appreciate you coming to talk to us today. Thanks, Marcel. It was a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, I, I'll say one last shout out. No, it's not an ad. I don't have, but, you know, if you ever had Gippers, there's a TC sandwich. So go get a TC sandwich at Gippers in Auburn. I will be there. We go there every year on Christmas Eve. I'll be there getting a TC sandwich. Nobody else in my family will get a TC sandwich, but I will order a TC <laughs> sandwich. A really good sandwich. Uh, so thanks. But thanks, Marcel. Appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Have a good one, everyone. Bye now.